This is Breaking Down Security. Hey, uh, welcome back, uh, dear listener. This is uh, Brian and Mr. Betcher, as always, for Bringing Down Security. Hello. Hey. So, um, my my day has just been off. I mean... Yeah. You jet lag? What? I don't know, man. It's been a rough week, because I know that you and I were supposed to have at least an interview with somebody of note this week that fell through. And of course, you know, anybody who's ever listened to podcasts understand that, you know, you're always scrambling to try to find out, you know, try to find that plan B or whatever. And hell, we couldn't even find a plan B. We're on plan C, man. Sucks. Yeah, but it's, <clears throat> it's still good, right? Well, sure, sure, sure. I mean, you know, we, uh, we're, there's no shortage of information security topics to discuss, uh, you right. know, so uh, we we're going back to what we know, and in this case, it's back to the SANS top 25 security controls. So we're going to talk about numbers 10 and 11 this week, um, which numbers number 10 is secure configurations for network infrastructure, and number 11 is limitation and control of those infrastructures, ports, protocols, and services. So... Okay. <clears throat> If we well, let's start with uh, number eleven, right? Yeah, let's continue doing stuff in reverse like we normally do, you know. <laughs> All right, so yeah, number eleven, the official name of it, and uh, we'll have a link to the PDF uh, on the uh, on the website there. And uh, the official name is limitation and control of network ports, protocols, and services. Right. So you, you know. Step one, or I guess bullet one, is ensure that all the ports, protocols, and services are required. So you don't want to have a port open or a protocol open in your firewall that you don't have to have. So uh, it's a good idea to audit those um, ACLs, if you will, or mm -hmm. routes or whatever, and uh, make sure that they are needed and they're uh, used for business. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that goes for security groups on like Amazon too, not just um, uh, ACLs and, and Cisco or I don't know what they call them for Juniper or, you know, F5 or whatever. Um, I guess they're all access control lists of some type. Um, so yeah, it's a, yeah, you don't want, uh, you don't want like port 514. You don't want syslog being able to send out unless you have a really, really good reason why you're allowing port 514 to go out or, um, you know, that, that's a whole thing about auditing your ingress and egress. If, if you know what's going in, you, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, figuring out if, if anything is unnecessary. So you want to pick the lowest possible required, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. You want services. to limit, you want to limit, uh, severely what goes in and out or through your firewalls, right? So um, <clears throat> that way, when you're when you're trying to uh, figure out a situation that's happening, some kind of an incident, you know that they could only enter uh, uh, certain ways. And and it's it's good practice to make your your set of uh, connectivity as small as possible and to keep track of it, right? So. Mm -hmm. I'll go further than saying it. Uh, what is um, necessary, you know, by going, hey, this is necessary for business reasons, right? Yeah, and you know, we're going to get to that in number number ten. You want to be able to track and audit those things as well. So, um, right. putting them in a CMDB, for instance, or a uh, um, I, I, I hate to say spreadsheet because it seems like InfoSec thrives on spreadsheets. You know, Excel is our primary tool, but uh, you, you want to be able to put it somewhere where you can get to it easily and, and, and be able to, you know, edit those in a, in a timely manner. Yeah. So then next is the port filtering, uh, yeah. ACLs, right? Yeah, well, it's port filtering or applying host-based firewalls. So not only are they wanting you to use the Cisco routers on your network segments and in your your multi-tiered network function, they also want you to block it at the 
the host level. Okay. That using like sense. IP tables or PF or PF sense or, you know, um, you know, a host Windows based firewalls. or Windows firewall. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I would imagine that uh, that's, that's more of that defense in depth thing where um, if you get inside a network segment, you don't want to be able to connect to just every box in that network segment. So having a firewall that blocks everything uh, reduces uh, pivots, possibly pivot points. Uh, That's right, and it keeps uh, malware also from infecting other users on your network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're blocking <clears throat> almost every outbound port except 22 or 80, uh, well, I mean, most malware inbound. runs on port A. Or inbound, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, you want to, you know, it, it will reduce your attack surface in, in many cases. So, yeah, again, the, the key is minimal necessary for Mm -hmm. business functionality right yep. so uh, you you want to to have a default deny and then a, a explicit allows yep 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 and that's uh that's kind of a the, the, you know like I said the defense in depth thing but that can get complicated I know that uh, uh, at places I've worked at in the past and and often uh, where I currently work uh, I have thought about you know implementing the host based firewall but unless you have some way of managing that across your infrastructure, because you talk about security standards for the firewalls. Well, if you, you know, have security standards per host, you're going to have to find some way to manage that either through um, a group policy for windows, or you need to do like a chef puppet type policy push because it can get overwhelming. It, it, you know, and if you don't, uh, if you don't follow a, a simple guideline for that. Sure. Um, in your in your server environment, though, that's pretty static. So you want to set it, and uh, you won't have to deal with it that often, unless you make changes to the environment. Maybe you're setting up a new application, uh, uh, you know, a new server or something like that. Then it then those things can change, but they're typically pretty static. In the user environment, you know, I, I suppose you could push out policies and that sort of thing. Yeah, that would that would be the best way, and that way you don't have to worry about going to each individual box and and doing that. If you can just push that to to specific um, specific hosts, and of course you want to make sure you've got at least port twenty two open on all those boxes, or uh, I don't know what Windows version would be to, to push out a GPO. But if you start blocking port twenty two, then you're really up a creek because there's short of uh, short of being physically on the box, you're going to be SOL. So uh, about this uh, this default deny and explicit allow. I was talking to a network engineer one time and he says, yeah, the evolution of that is you do your default deny and your explicit allow and then and then you get into, well, but I, but I want to deny also, uh, I'm going to allow this huge range, right, for mm -hmm. my customer or whatever, but then I, I want to deny some IPs in that and it just gets to where it's like a cyclical thing. You have denies, uh -huh within allows, within more denies, within allows, mm -hmm. and it just gets out of hand. So you need to, you know, lay down the law and have only explicit allows. Yep, yep. And with most ACLs, you can either filter by IP address or um, uh, destination or uh, port in that case. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah. Source, destination, port, protocol, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. interface. Yep. yep. Get to exactly. that. Oh yeah, interface as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, eleven three, of course, is performing port scans, which you should be doing on a regular basis. I mean, that should be like, I, I don't want to say it's an everyday thing, but I I fire up Nmap and use it at least, I would say three to four times a week, just to you know look around on the on the network you know finding odd things you know you have to know it's normal so when you're doing a port scan if you are looking at a scan and you you know everything on port 80 you know uh, you've got all these boxes around port 80 port 40 443 is fine and then all of a sudden one of your web servers is running i don't know 69 68 you're like i don't know what that is but i need to investigate it and that's right yeah, it's uh, it's important to know what the normal is uh, when you're when you're doing those things, uh, especially if if you know your firewalls are set up to block specific port numbers, and all of a sudden those port numbers are open 
and uh, that would suck. Yeah, that would suck. Yeah, because then you so, gotta start uh, investigating, and yeah, it gets all paperworky. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I accomplish this with vulnerability scanning. All right. So you scan uh-huh. once a week, once a month, once a day, whatever, whatever your your purview, and then uh, see what the differences are. Right? Now, do you do uh, what? Why do you do the the vulnerability scanning as port scanning? Is it because um, your it's vulnerability? Sc- I mean, it's set every day, and I get a report. It's automated. That kind of thing. So it's a, just a discovery scan, is what you're doing there. Right. Okay. Right. Discovery scan and then take the difference of that and your last discovery scan. And you can see what changed in your environment, right? Yeah. And, you know, most underlying vulnerability scanners, at least the one I use currently, uh, uses Nmap as its discovery and uh, service uh, discovery uh-huh. system anyway. Uh, I don't know if uh, if the one you use, Mr. Betcher, is, uh, uses similar technology, but I think they're all based on Nmap. So. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nmap would be the baseline for that. So, so you, it also gives you the opportunity to know what what ports are running and why they're running, right? So, mm-hmm. why is port you know three three eight nine open on this particular server? Well, that uh, should be documented as well. Like, yeah. what is this port and why am I using it? And what is the business justification for for having this port open on this server? Yeah. And you can say, well, it's for this reason, and here's why we need it for business. Yeah. And and 3389, of course, is RDP for, for Windows, which which is good if, if 3389 is open on a Windows box, but if 3389 is open on a Linux box, that's an entirely different ball of wax. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. We could we could be having user uh, account harvesting or, mm-hmm. or maybe maybe we're doing some AD active defense. We yeah. want to make it look like a Windows box when, in fact, it's not. You know, mm-hmm. there could be many reasons why yep. Uh, yep. it's like that. 11.4, keep all services up to date and uninstall or remove any unnecessary components from the system. Now, they're, in this case, they're talking about infrastructure, right? So if your Cisco firewall has a uh, – Cisco uh, – I only know Cisco kit, so I don't know about the other ones, but I, I assume you can get special modules for uh, doing authentication or you can get it to do uh, DHCP. I mean, if you really had to, your Cisco router could use, uh, could, could, could run a DHCP service for your hosts on the network. Um, if your Cisco firewall or your Juniper firewall or your F5 or, or whatever has you know, DHCP or DNS uh, available on that, um, you should ask if that's a requirement or it's still needed and get, and get rid of that because you don't need DHCP or DNS running on your router. Conceivably, in the enterprise, you'll have a dedicated DNS or DHCP server uh, that you don't need to use on the router. And that can, all, that can cause all kinds of things because a guy who gains access to your router could start advertising DNS and start advertising you know, bad websites or uh, start putting out fake IP addresses on the network. Now, I don't know how that is for Cisco, but I've had one, de- when I used to work in San Diego, we had a developer who accidentally started, well, accidentally on purpose started DHCP on his own workstation as a service and uh, he <laughs> brought down the entire network by sending out fake IP addresses. So, um, yeah, so that's, I mean, it's just yeah. stuff you don't need. Uninstall it. You know that that goes for workstations or even infrastructure. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I had a uh, a guy where I used to work at the place where I used to work ah. uh, plugging in a router, home router, at his desk, but he plugged it in backwards, so it started doling out IP addresses. Right? Did you beat him with his shoe? Did you take a shoe? Uh, not in so many words. He needed but, to be beaten. You, you know the the DHCP thing. Um, a lot of times you wouldn't want that in a in an enterprise environment. You would want to assign addresses manually and not have them automatically assigned. Because what if somebody just plugs something in and, and then he gets an address right automatically? You don't want or, that to happen. Or you can do a static DHCP and just dole out IPs based on you know okay this MAC address connected. Give them an IP address. 
Sure. But it's always the same IP address. So it looks like it's DHCP, but it's not <laughs> really. And it, it would save you some, uh, you know, it depends on your environment, if that's, uh, if that's feasible for you. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, get rid of that DHCP or DNS service on your router switcher or, or if you don't need it on there. So. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, keep services and unnecessary components up to date. Mm-hmm. That's the one we're on, right? No, that was so, that was eleven four. Eleven five is the one you're talking about. You want to talk about? Do I? Verify <laughs> any server visible from the internet or an untrusted network, and if it's not required for business purposes, move it to an internal VLAN or give it a private address. Well, that makes sense. You know? Yeah, I mean, you you need to know this server or this device is used for this purpose. Yeah, you don't want a right. publicly facing FTP server just sitting out there with a routable IP and network with no controls. I mean, any of your servers that you're using that are publicly facing should at least have a hop through a firewall for flow control, you know, to make sure somebody's not trying to, uh, you know, if you can't afford, you know, the, 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 the bulletproof DDoSing services, you can use a firewall to... Um, you know, do flow control. So somebody's doing D DDoS on you or denial service, uh, they it can be used to help you know drop some of the bad packets if you, they need to. Or um, for FTP, if somebody needs to you know get to FTP, you you have a way of uh, monitoring connections or um, you know making sure that you know, your systems are connected. So that's what the DMZ is for that we mentioned in a, in a previous segment. That's right. All and, your stuff needs to go into a DMZ. And that kind of leads back to uh, conduct automated port scans, right? So yeah, you don't want that FTP server connected to the internet. And that's why you scan on the inside as well as from the internet. Yeah. So you want to scan all these things from your internal network and your, uh, and the internet. Uh, because they'll have different interfaces open on different uh, areas of your network, including yeah. the internet. Yeah, that's a good point. You, you mentioned scanning externally. Uh, it, you got to know what your IP range is on the outside. If you have a 22 uh, slash 22 CIDR uh, notation, which means you got, uh, what is it, 24 is uh, 512. So you got like 2,048 IP addresses. That's a little big, so you're going to be a pretty decent sized company. Um, is it, is it 2048? 24 is 256, 23 is 512, so 22 would be 1,000. 1,024, I'm sorry. 21 is, is 2048. So, yeah. you know, let's say you're a, you're a small to medium business and you don't have a 22. Let's say you have a, a slash 29 or something. So you have a handful of IP addresses. Uh, you need to be doing regular port scanning of those spaces because you may not use all your IP addresses externally. If somebody gets in and can set up a server in your DMZ or set up a service that locks onto a specific IP address, you need to know that. You, you shouldn't just scan the IP addresses that you know have servers on them. You have to scan the dark areas of your network as well. Um, Good point. So in, in case something is hiding out there, which uh, IPv4 is easy enough to scan because there's only so many ports. I mean, you got like 4 million, you know, 4 trillion or something odd IP addresses, but with IPv6, it's going to get even more difficult because it's like 87 Brazilian quadrillion, you know, IP addresses. So, um, you know, making sure you're scanning and keeping track of, of your IP addresses is very important, which is why you want to do the port scanning. Yes. And that wraps up number 11, limit and controls of network ports, protocols, and services. No way, homeboy. No way, wait, wait, wait. Why? You got 11.6 and 11.7. Really? Yeah. They're not in the notes, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll put them in the notes. Those? No, I didn't skip them. Right. I may not have gotten to them uh, the last okay, time okay. we did this. Maybe they changed them since we did the notes. Guys, we, we did the show notes like that's a it. few months ago. Yes, that's So maybe Sans updated and, and added a couple. So Yeah, that that's that's it. We'll go with right. that. I mean, yeah, we'll do that. So 11.6 is... the most logical choice. Exactly. 11.6 is operating critical services on a separate physical or logical host machine, such as DNS, file, mail, web, or DB servers. 
which makes yeah. sense. That's a PCI I report. About that before. I mean, separation of uh, duties, right? For for your web, for you know, your network devices. Yeah, separate network devices, right? Networks. No, they're already separate. Um, yeah, separation of duties for your servers. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's right. That's right. Now, for PCI, I know we're we're going to use PCI, but. Um, if you have two servers that are doing AD, you know, primary and a secondary, you can you can get around it by running, say, two AD servers, one primary, one secondary. The secondary could be your primary DNS server. That's so, true. Yeah, and that, that'll save you some footprint. Limit it as much as, as is feasible, right? Yeah, that'll save you some footprint because then you don't have to have two DNS servers. You can have your primary... DNS on your secondary AD server, you know, and then if you fail over and you have to fail over to your secondary systems, you you run, you know, that way for a little while, but it's, it's, you're not running that way all the time. And, and, uh, and a good way to, to um, separate these is virtualize. Mm -hmm. So you can have one physical machine uh, controlling uh, a bunch of different smaller VMs that are all doing one thing. Yeah. Or, uh, something I've been learning recently, Zen. Zen is kind of a big deal. Um, I, I don't hate it. It works actually pretty well. So, um, But yeah, I, I run a bunch of little boxes. And yeah, I mean, I've got an entire virtualized lab just sitting right here under my, my, my desk for about 2500 bucks. So, And that's our sponsor for this segment. <laughs> no, no, not Zen. Jeez. So... Uh, yeah, so I mean, and, and some of those things are going to be pretty intensive. So you're not going to want to run multiple things on them anyway, like your DB servers. You're not going to be running Active Directory or files. Well, you may run file server, but you may you don't want to be running something that's disk intensive. You know, more than more than one service that's you know disk intensive. So yeah, you don't want to be running your database server, your mail server, and your web server on the same server. Yeah, right? that's a that's a recipe for uh, for a late night your call. BMZ. Yeah, that's a that's that's a recipe for late night call, I think. So, uh, the final one is eleven seven, and it said place firewall application firewalls in front of any critical servers to verify and validate traffic going to the server. So basically, uh, put WAFs in front of your web servers. That's what they're trying to say. Where does it say WAF? It says firewall application yeah. firewall. That's what okay, I said. That is WAF. Yeah, that's okay. what I said. Yeah. Now, are there any other kinds of uh, other kinds of application firewalls? Um, basically, they they do content filtering, right? They make sure that you know people aren't trying to send malformed requests and um, you know other sure, other they're, naughty they're, uh, They inspect the traffic and and look for certain signatures. Yeah, they scrub yeah. out things. Yeah, and they'll actively uh, block uh, mm -hmm. things that meet those signatures. Yeah. And you know, we uh, one of our first interviews was with uh, Kevin Johnson over there at Secure Ideas, and he talked about how easy it is to get around those things um, because they're based on rules, and rules are made by people, and people make mistakes. So when you're doing your rules for your WAFs, you need to again do the default deny, but only allow, like whitelisting, like uh, when you're doing input sanitization, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago with uh, the code stuff. Uh, the problem with that is the um, the way these application firewalls work is they are a default allow, and then they blacklist those um, signatures. So that's they're filthy. Kind of working contrary to what uh, we talked about in what eleven two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So so be careful when you when you don't rely strictly on application firewalls or these uh, signature-based uh, security mechanisms mm -hmm. is all I'm saying. And that's yeah. what Kevin uh, had a problem with. Mm -hmm. is the, for him, for a, for a sophisticated attacker, they're just speed bumps. Yeah. Okay? Um, and they take a lot of resources to run. I personally don't care for application firewalls. Um, I don't think they, they offer as much as they... Uh, you know, lead on. Wow. Why, yeah. why do you have a shirt that says, I hate WAFs, man? That hurts, man. Ah, 
So you can read that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, dude. Yeah, I, I kind of agree because I mean, it, it, uh, if it's like you say and everything's open and you have to lock it down, you're going to be chasing your tail all the time. You're going to, you know, depending on various, uh, you know, encodings or, uh, yeah. you know, base 64 images on a, on, a, on a server, you know, that's going to get right through because there's certain, it's like antivirus, you know, it's going to have, it's going to look for specific signatures and it's not going to find those things. It's going to be like, okay, I'll let this uh, base 64 uh, encoded yeah. URL go through with no problem. And then of course now you're owned. So, so I guarantee you web application firewalls are blocking or one equals one, you know, Sure. And that's a classic signature um, uh, SQL injection attempt. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> or two equals two is good, though. We're, we're cool with two equals two. Yeah. yeah. So if two equals two, I don't know what to do with that. Just let it through. Yeah. One equals one, ah, oh, we can't have that. Yeah. So that that's the way uh, that's the way these things work. So um, and and you know um, I'm I've got a you know, I took a, a class on, on a particular WAF. I was, uh, I was there. instructed on a particular, let's see, you know, I didn't want to speak for you, man. Man. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I remember taking that class. And uh, at the time, we didn't understand a lot of, of, of what was going on, how WAFs worked and everything. But, um, yeah, it's uh, if we'd have known then what we know now, uh, we would have been able to ask way more smart questions than we did. So. <laughs> Yeah. We all we all grow up though and mature. Yeah. Yep. Well, some of us. I don't want to grow up. Anyway. So all right, so that was number eleven. Number eleven is done now, finally. Um okay. so we're gonna go to number ten. Ten is uh the secure, like you said, secure oh, oh goodness. Um, Did you lose it? I've got a new Wacom tablet thing for my computer because my touchpad died so now i'm trying to figure out how to make it work secure configurations for network devices so this is this one should be pretty easy right we're just going to be creating specific configurations for each firewall router and switch and that's what right. one so, says. so so yeah bullet one says uh, maintain a best practices or a configuration template mm -hmm. i think that's those are my words but yeah. uh for each type of device so um I want to take that a little bit further. It's not limited to network devices. You can do this for servers as well. You sure. have a particular application server setup. You know, mm -hmm. this is how I set up an application server in my environment. Follow these instructions, and they're going to be all the same. Yeah. Right? You don't want 50 different configurations of the same type of server. Same thing with database servers, same thing with web servers. Yeah. And your desktops as well, uh, your endpoint machines. Yeah. You want to set those up consistent. I mean, here, consistency and, and simplicity is the key, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it used to be a lot more difficult before virtualization and, and you know, whatever. I've seen where people just take an application server, right-click and clone, and now they have a brand-new application server that is set up, you know, per a golden master or golden image. So, you know, the, yes. the setup time is almost nothing, and you have a perfect machine every time. Right. And for the physical devices, it's not that easy, but you still have a script that you run or, or some kind of instructions that you have. I want to install these packages. Mm -hmm. I do not want to install these. I yeah. want to, you know, disable such and such or whatever yeah. uh, configuration. You know, it, you need to have that stable set approved configuration in your environment. Otherwise, things can get out of hand quickly. Yeah. Uh, guys start, uh, you know, going rogue, right? Yeah. Cowboying it up uh, on your uh, network. Yeah, when I was uh, when I was working for a defense contractor, um, we had a basic Gen 2 install. And, you know, to, to, to tell you how old it was, it was on a 2.4 kernel. And... After you did the install of Gentoo, you ran this massive, We had, I think it was 15,000 shell script, 15,000 lines of shell script in one shell script. And it spent like 30 minutes looking through most every CVE out there and finding out if that was a vulnerable version or, you know, it also looked at tripwire 
um, type CIS benchmarks and would automatically configure the system and change config files and all that stuff. I mean, it was a, it was a pain, but it was something we had to do because we didn't, uh, you know, it was the only way to do it. And that was uh, setting up a new system, huh? Yeah, so every time we set up a new system, uh, mostly for testing, because when we deployed these things, it came in a special CD or something uh, right. that you basically double click on an icon and go. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a pretty arduous task. I mean, not only you know did it uninstall packages, it actually you know recompiled, uh, say, OpenSSL and got rid of certain uh, ciphers or. Um, you know, uh, reconfigured Apache for uh, using the MPM fork, so it could use multi-threaded processing on the on the, the Apache. So, yeah, some of those, so, you know, and, and as long as we did it every time, then it was great. Um, you know, I'm sure that was yeah. that was five six years ago, so I'm sure the technology's yeah. gotten better. <laughs> and if any change need to be made, you uh, you know, cut it off at the head by changing that yeah. script, right? Yeah, exactly, and or you added a little little bit inside to, to make it smarter or faster. So yeah, so um, um, again, uh, these configurations there are, there there are certain settings on network devices. Okay, uh, obviously, for example, password encryption. Right, you mm. can set your password encryption to no. <laughs> That's right. Of course, we want passwords to be encrypted, right? Sure. So, so make sure that in your document or script or whatever you're running that this particular setting is set to yes. You do want passwords to be encrypted, that kind of thing. Uh, it, they all have different log settings, SNMP settings, mm -hmm. uh, NTP. Uh, yep. You know, do you want Telnet enabled? No. If you do. No. Yeah. yeah. No. So. Um, you know, do you want SSH version one enabled? No, no. Right. So, so um, if you don't have these standards in place, you could get all those bad things popping up, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, either you can automate that, or you just make sure you have a a, a proper procedural document that says, okay. Make sure you're doing X, Y, and Z. And you might also want to check from time to time because some things can get you know, enabled temporarily because that helps fix an issue or works around an existing problem, and then somebody forgets to re-disable re it. Re <laughs> first, they forget to disable it. Uh, so, you know, oh, let's turn on Telnet just for a few minutes, and okay, it works now. And then they forget to disable Telnet. Yeah, so now yeah, you've got Telnet running on a box. Uh, let's uh, see. Yeah, Telnet. Speaking of Telnet, well, you know. Filthy. Um, I just um, have this thing in my brain here that one time uh, I got into a new environment, did some vulnerability scanning, found out that Telnet was enabled uh -huh. on a bunch of network devices. Oh my. And the reasoning I got to, as to why it was enabled and why it needed to be kept enabled was, well, if SSH should break, we use Telnet as a backup. Uh, when has SSH broken? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I could check with the guys and see. So, so yeah, you don't need Telnet. Yeah. Anymore. Ever. Sorry. Unless you're a medical device manufacturer and your pumps need to have. Oh, God, that. Man. Yes. I'll I'll post a link to a news article and a, actually a CVE about that. So. It'll make you it'll make you mad. So, um, the, and the point is that we should have consistent uh, configurations across the board. That's what we're getting mm -hmm. to. Keep it simple, stupid, right? Exactly, exactly. So, um, what what was that? Ten two. No, uh, that was one. Oh, okay. I so, uh, all new configuration rules beyond a ten two is all configuration rules beyond a baseline hardened config that allow traffic to flow through network security devices should be documented and recorded in a CMDB or configuration management system. Uh oh, interesting. Okay. Configuration management. Where did we hear that from? I forget. Uh, hmm. Maybe it was Mr. Tim Wood and the yes. ITIL dude. Yes. Configuration management. Exactly. Right. So you want to put um, all of these configurations in a database. 
That's right. Yeah, that's the best place for them. Uh, unless you, you're a small organization, you want to deal with the spreadsheets, you can do that as well. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we highly recommend the database. Yeah. Um, and uh, making sure that uh, these, <clears throat> for example, ACLs, these connectivities that you're allowing through your environment are documented somewhere. That yeah. way, hey, if I, I if I change something, that means I don't need these anymore, right? And I can get rid of them. You do a quick search in your CMDB, maybe you have them allocated to a specific project. That project uh, no longer exists, so it is linked to all these ACLs that need to be removed. You don't want to keep uh, access lists in your firewalls forever. They do have a lifetime. No, they don't. Well, technically they don't, right? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm a little bitter. I'm a little bitter because I used to work at a place where, you know, getting ACLs taken out was like pulling teeth. But, um, you know, that hard. Uh, it is. It's not easy, uh, especially if uh, you haven't really, you know, if you don't regularly do uh, firewall audits, then you end up with uh, a lot of useless, you know, rules that have to be tracked down, especially the documentation's not there. So, um, that's right. The one thing I like about this, though, is it says anything beyond a baseline hardened configuration. So the idea is you're supposed to have a baseline, which would be in the CMDB is, hey, this is the baseline. But then it's like well, you're it'll, it'll be in your 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 uh, configuration template or your best practices template. That's yeah. your baseline. Yeah. So that's that's going to be a default. Yep. Right? Yeah. But then anything beyond that would be right? in the CMDB. That's right. Yeah. Because oh this the, these firewall controls the databases so it has X config in addition to the baseline hardened config or mm -hmm. you know because this legacy application needs port twenty and twenty one open for FTP that's why we have this open with a business justification I know auditors love having that kind of documentation in place instead of you having to hunt it down. Yeah, you, you have a lot of documentation to give to the auditor. You slam them a hundred pages worth of, of stuff. They'll they'll flip through it. They might ask for examples, but for, I'll give you an example. I do a lot of uh, vulnerability management, right? And so I I have all these. You do too. Huh? Uh, yeah. I have all this documentation, and I have these spreadsheets that will blow your mind. Right, mm -hmm. you give that to an auditor, and he looks through a spreadsheet that's got like twenty thousand lines in it. Yeah, and he's going to say, "Okay, this, this guy looks like he knows what he's doing. I'm going to move on to something that's a little more questionable." Yeah, you know. And so, yeah. you know, five years, six years of doing this, I've never been questioned on, you know, the uh, vulnerability scanning. Right? Yep. Maybe it's uh, how do you you know, what's the procedure that you go through, things like that, but but never, hey, uh, what, what's this line item number 10,360? I don't quite get this. No, I've never been asked that. Yeah. Yeah, they don't want to search through a 20,000 line spreadsheet to find that one thing. They're looking for glaringly obvious, you know, if you couldn't give them that information immediately, then they know there's probably something there to, to dig through. So Yeah. Uh, okay, so 10.3, uh, use automated tools to verify standard device configurations and detect changes. All yeah, alterations should be reported to security personnel. Yeah, there's some there's some software out there that allows you to monitor changes that, that are happening. Um, I can't remember it. I can't remember the one that, that you and I were looking at using there at the office. Remember... Uh, uh, the um, I don't I don't remember what it is, but um, yeah, it's a uh, they there are some tools that'll keep track of your changes to your network devices. Yeah, right? and, and either they'll scan the device for changes to the config by doing a diff of the existing config versus what they have on file, or your IT personnel makes the changes through the application and will you know you'll have an audit trail then it'll be like, okay, this person logged on at X time and he, you know, yeah. SSH through our application to X firewall and he made the changes to this config and 
you know, he closed out at this time. So, I mean, it, you know, it's, it can go either way. If you make changes on the device, it will look for that, or you can go through the, the actual device to make the change. That's right. And, uh, you know, it keeps track of who did what. Uh, mm -hmm. It can, uh, you know, you put the ticket number in that, like the change record. Yeah, you can so put comments in, that kind of thing. Change, yeah. To your change management system, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Good, yep. good stuff. Yep. And, you know, uh, you can either, you know, it, if you're a big company or a small company and you can't do that, then you might have something like, um, you know, you might have an email system where, the you know, your IT guy says, okay, I'm going to make the change now. I'm going to make the change, and these are the changes that I'm going to put in. You know, here's the config file prior to, here's the config file after. I mean, there's, there's ways of doing a piecemeal that's not going to cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars to implement because those change applications are not cheap. So it, there may be an easier procedural way of doing it if your um, change management processes are solid enough that you, uh, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know. And there's free change to management tools as well. Exactly, exactly. So a 10.4 using two-factor auth, encrypted sessions. That, I think we already touched on that. Use an SSH to yeah. connect your infrastructure whenever possible. Actually, all possible, because I think all of them use SSH now. Um, what's the, yeah. what's the, how do, can you use two-factor auth to access uh, switches and routers? Well, you, you'd have to, you know, make them only accessible through a VPN connection, that kind yeah. of thing. Th yeah, that. That's uh, doable. Yeah, or you know, you use something like Radius for uh, you know centralized authentication. That way, you don't have to worry about uh, you know maintaining passwords across multiple infrastructure. Uh, that's a way of doing it. Is you know uh, doing a centralized um, system. I'm sure you can integrate two-factor auth that way too. Or, or like you said, you know, use a VPN to connect to the management console or um, and make sure your you VPN have has a trusted two host. Server yeah. things like that. Yeah, you can have a bastion host or something that uh, you use to connect. So bastion, bastion. I love that word. It's an awesome word. I still really get to use it in normal conversation. Ten five. That's pretty duh duh. Use stable version of any security related updates. Just make sure you're patching your stuff. Yeah, you know? update stuff. That's what I got. Yeah, update um, update your junk. Uh, make sure that. Uh, and you know what? Sometimes you may get out of band stuff that doesn't necessarily. Uh, you know, your your monthly patches may be optional and or uh, you may be using modules that aren't, uh, you know, that are specially, you know, that are special made and, and there might be patches outside. So make sure that if you're using any kind of special modules in your infrastructure that those are getting updated if they're not part of the, the regular maintenance, uh, you know. And the last one. Yes. Manage network devices on a separate channel. Sure. Right. So management network, yeah. Yeah, right. you have a separate management network. Don't uh, access them. Oh, well, if you have a firewall that's connected to the Internet, don't access your firewall from the Internet. <laughs> right? Oh, okay. You better go well, uh, fix that. Yeah, I got to, yeah. No, that's just that's just common sense. I mean, um, what's well, amazing? Not necessarily. It's not necessarily common sense. I just use that as an example. But, sure. you know, you could have a... a network um, that all you, your end users are on and you're managing your firewall from that same network you know yeah you should have a separate network so it's um, you know something that you need to to look at I guess if you haven't before if you don't know this already you know make sure you manage these things from a separate management network yeah and disable the management ports on the the user network because you shouldn't have access to the management console from your from your per, you know your work network or your office network or whatever yeah. you should have to go to a separate network vlan that is vlan off completely so not even like a, if you're on a 10 dot network you know make it a 192 network for your management lan and make sure that uh, your switches and routers can't directly connect you might even have yeah, to have could. a separate drop dedicated to connect to that box for, I don't know, air gap purposes or, or what have you. Yeah, whatever you're trying to protect and how far you want to go with that. And make sure it's two-factor, right? Yep, exactly. Um, yes. So, um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, what do we what do we get takeaways from this? This was a pretty uh, network infrastructure centric esque podcast this week. Um, they put it as let's see, it's number ten and eleven, so it's kind of midway through the you know through the the critical controls. So there's other things that are they consider to be more important. Uh, right. Or less important in this case, uh, depending on in which direction you're going, to <clears throat> to making uh, you know to making your systems more secure. I I would have probably put this as the you know pretty pretty a little lower than this I I would think because you can get anywhere through network infrastructure. I would I would have assumed that this would have been one of the more important things. But By of course, lower, you mean like a lower number, like higher in the list. Yeah, okay. more. Yeah, because number more one is technically like the the lowest one that we should have started with, and number twenty being the the last one we should have done. <laughs> the last one we should have done. But I would have I thought infrastructure. You know, I'm thinking outside in. So when I'm thinking outside in, I'm thinking firewalls, infrastructure switches is going to be one of the first things that you're going to want to look at securing, and then secure the endpoint. But I don't know. Maybe as we go down the line here, we get closer to number one. Uh, you know, the reason they put it here will make itself more apparent. We'll we'll reach Nirvana, infosec Nirvana, once we get through number one. Yep, right? and then and then what you'll want to do, dear listeners, to start at that one and work your way backwards in time to number <laughs> twenty. Yeah, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know who came up with that, but we're going to continue. We're going to trudge on. Yep. Uh, my takeaway, um, you know, if you've never looked at a firewall config or a router config, um, do that. Pull, yeah. have network guys, if you can't, pull these configurations from your devices and take a look at them and compare them. See if you see anything different about how they're configured and, and ask questions. Like why, you know, to yourself at first, mm -hmm. why, is, why is this configured in such a way and this device which seems very similar it's the same model and everything else it's configured differently maybe you should take a look at that and, and you know start asking questions start getting more uh, you know involved in this type of network configuration yeah and you know firewall audits and firewall configurations and stuff are part of many a compliance framework so um, if you're involved at all with your compliance uh, requirements at your organization, you're going to have to do yeah. audits of the configuration of the ACLs of where, you know, they're sitting in the network. You know, does the placement of your infrastructure make sense? I mean, uh, do you have a firewall in your DMZ that's protecting your DMZ from the outside world, but also a firewall that's protecting your DMZ from the inside? Because yeah. if somebody was to get to your DMZ, can they get into the inside without even you know with no with no controls there, there should be that's why they have a multi-layer you know uh, topology there for your network your dmz needs to be separate you may even have multiple dmz's depending on you know what each dmz's function is if one's for yeah. clients if one's for you know business customers. associates or customers yeah exactly um, you may have multiple dmz's and you may not want your dmz's even to connect so you may have a firewall between those so yeah, you need to look at your network topology and your network configurations and make sure that you're not leaking or, or, or there's not a way to leak that information between your DMZs or between your different network segments. And and if this doesn't get you looking at them, here's here's another one. If you know your auditor is going to look at these configurations, or he or she is going to want to look at those. Yes. Yeah. And that, they that's part ask of their job. And if they don't, they're they're doing it wrong. Yep, and they may ask you questions, and if you don't understand that, then you know they're going to want to understand it, and they're going to you're you're going to you're going to learn to understand it either way. Either the auditor is going to make you understand it, or uh, you're going to want to do it on your own and and, and figure that out. So um, yeah, so start putting in some trouble tickets, uh, asking for firewall configs. There's plenty of instruction out there. I had to learn on my own with the Cisco kit. You know how how an ACL works. Cisco's documentation is pretty good on their website. Uh, um, you know, so I know access list, interface, deny or no allow, blah blah blah, IP address, port. You know, any any oh god, don't do any any man. 
I remember right. I remember starting work with you. You were like, man, I got this pivot table. There's like all these any any rules because you put this in. Yeah, you know, it got better though. It got better though. You know. Yeah, so, pivot tables. Yeah, yummy. Yeah, and you know, firewall audits is it's not glamorous at all. Doing configs on you know it, it's not sexy, but it has to be done. It's one of those things. Yeah. So, all right, well, that was it for this week. So let me see. You know, um, wait. Why don't you uh, Why don't you do some of that stuff in pink? And I need to look something up. You need to look something up. Yes, okay. do some of that stuff in pink there on the. Uh... <clears throat> All right. Well, you can look us up on Twitter. My co-host there is uh, at Brian Brake, and I'm at Betcher Pwned, P W N E D. And uh, you can follow us on, or you can leave us some ratings on iTunes, right? Yeah, we, um, we love the iTunes. We love the, we love the iTunes feedback. And, yep. uh, you know, we have a cyberary forum. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh, Brian yeah. Is on, uh, he set up us a cyberary forum. You guys can go on there and ask questions. Yep, and you can take some free training that's uh, available on there. You know, they've, uh, they've got some Metasploit training. they got all kinds of stuff. Cool. Are you doing a training uh, training course? I am break? doing. I'm currently doing the Python prof for professionals on there. Um, it's actually pretty good. They uh, they just started that one a couple of weeks ago. Um, damn it! I'm trying to get into our Patreon so that I can see who has been giving us. Uh, I'm, I'm doing C plus plus coding for amateurs. Really? Currently, yeah. No. That's not on Cybrary though. No, I, I am doing a uh, like a. Uh, a side project in C and C++. Yeah, and I will tell you that, um, you know, <clears throat> okay, so I'm doing some Windows system calls, right, and you do them in C, and, and uh, I haven't, you know, looked at C strings in quite a while because I use the C++ uh, string, right? So I, so I Google C string, and, um, yeah, you don't want to do that. Really? The stuff I saw, ooh. Yeah, go ahead and Google it right now and tell me what. Do you know what C string is? Uh uh. Okay, Google C string. Okay, well, not right now. Maybe that's a that's something for another time. Uh, okay. At least for our podcast listeners, because. Okay, you gonna cut this out? No, probably not. Uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to do is find all of our current patrons. There it is. All right, so we're on Patreon. Patreon is something that you can, you know, if you feel that you get a good value from our podcast. And I only started it because I had several people go, Hey, I'd like to give you some money. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't need the money that I have in my pocket. I'd like to support you. So I was like, all right, fine. So I set one up. We have five, uh, supporters. I appreciate them. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, Leroy Jenkins, which is freaking, freaking betcher over here. This is Leroy Jenkins, uh, John, Andre, and of course myself. So um, we appreciate you guys giving us money. I, I know you don't have to, and there are many other options that are available to you to support. So thank you for that. Um, our Facebook just hit 11,500 followers. All right, everybody, that's it for this week. Uh, Sands number 10, number 11 in the bag. So uh, if you enjoy it, let us know. Come back soon and we'll see you again. Bye-bye. things I've got to stop now. I've got the recording over there. I got the go to oh, here. I've got the tap. What, dude? I didn't record my end. Shut up. No, I didn't. You're Damn it. you're lying, right? No, I'm not lying. I never hit record. Oh.
I didn't hear a click when I said three, two, one, record, done. Dang it. You got it though, right? You are so ungodly lucky. I have it on both the Tascam and the GoToMeeting. Well, I knew you. I knew you. You're like, I'm recording it on four devices, man. You are freaking killing me. That would have been awful. And I even tested it and everything. <sighs> you know, I did the sound check. And this is going on Patreon. At weird... least this part here. This 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 is going in the like the bloopers at the end. Okay. This got to go. It's the... just a weird weird day for me. I don't know. We, we came yeah. on early, and then I was like, I just got home, and you're like, Hey, let's do it. And I know, dude. I'm know, sorry. Complete. You know what? You know what got me. What got me was we have construction going on out on like the main road of our uh, here in, in Snoqualmie. Twenty five minutes of traffic. Twenty five. And so it got me, and that that got me, and, and I was having such a great time. I hiked that freaking hill, you know, and it just threw them off my threw off my rhythm, man. So yeah, this is gonna be like the bloopers at the end. I'm gonna pull a defensive sec and put a little something in there. So. Um, yeah, so let me uh, let me stop recording.